Greetings in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of Jefferson Presbyterian Church, Jefferson, Georgia. My name is Paul Evans and I'm blessed to be pastor of this loving, caring congregation. Joining me once again are our keyboardist, Sylvia McDonald, and our videographer, Kathy Marquez. We're pleased to be able to bring this recorded service into your homes or to other places where you may be viewing it. And we continue to be most grateful for the enthusiastic responses we receive from you all. We invite you to continue join us as you have opportunity. Our prayer is that this time of worship will be meaningful and transformative for you. If you wish to rewatch this service or commend it to someone else, please know that you may go to our link on our Facebook page, Jefferson Presbyterian Church, or you may find the service by accessing youtube.com and searching for Jefferson Presbyterian Church, Jefferson, Georgia. Here in our congregation, we always begin our time of worship with a greeting and a time of passing the peace of Christ. Continuing that tradition, despite the lack of a physical congregation, I invite each of you to take a brief moment and turn to those about you and offer the words, the peace of Christ be with you. And as you offer that to others, you may in response say as they offer it to you and also with you. So let us now greet one another in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. Having greeted one another in the spirit of fellowship, I now invite us to prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of Almighty God as Sylvia leads us in her prelude. Family of faith, let us be called to worship with these great three phrases from the history of the church. Christ has come. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Let us join our hearts and minds now in worship to Almighty God who is preparing us for life in his kingdom. Let us pray together. Glorious God, you reign. 
robed in majesty and armed with strength, you hold our world and our lives securely. Your throne has stood for all eternity from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Even when the waters rise up, when surging seas threaten to overwhelm us and pounding waves crash around us, we know that you're mightier, you're more powerful than the threats we face. Holy God, your decrees are firm and unshakable and will last forevermore. Amen. and sisters believing that we hear the word of God aright when we confess our sins to God. Let us now go before God who is more willing to hear us than we are to even pray. Let us pray. We come, O oh Lord, on this day of glory to confess our lack of trust. While we sing of your lordship over all creation, we have too often acted as though you are powerless in the face of today's events. Hear us now as we offer our own prayer of confession. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, sisters and brothers, hear and believe the good news of the gospel as the Apostle Paul reminded the church at Rome with these powerful words of God's goodness toward us. He writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit and the life of Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. I declare, therefore, on the authority of Jesus Christ, that you and I, we all are forgiven.
Family faith, I invite us now to go before the Lord for a time of prayer. Please join me. Almighty God, we thank you for the wonder of ascension, that marvelous yet mysterious moment in the life of the apostles, which left them gazing heavenwards in confusion, yet departing in joy. We thank you for the way it brought about the earthly ministry of Jesus to a fitting conclusion, signifying his oneness with you and demonstrating your final seal of approval in all that he had done. We thank you that through his ascension, Jesus is now free to be Lord of all, no longer bound to a particular place or time, but with us always able to reach even to the ends of the earth. We thank you that through his departing, Jesus prepared for his coming again through his spirit and his coming again in glory. And we anticipate and await that time, O oh God, and we pray that you will help us to be faithful bearers of the message of the kingdom. May we speak and live the good news so that our witness will be signs of the presence of the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. In these challenging times, O oh Lord, remind us of your presence and power. Help us to live in confidence of your sovereign reign over all creation. In the midst of so much despair across the globe, enable us to bring the message of hope found in Christ. And especially for those whose lives are so profoundly impacted by the coronavirus. May we surround them with our prayers and our gifts and as appropriate, our loving presence. Continue to bless all who contend against evil, whether evils of disease, evils of poverty and hunger, the evils of hate and war. By your common grace, O God, reach down and touch lives so that they may become agents of healing and wholeness to those in such need. These things we pray in the name of our risen Lord who gave us this prayer and who teaches us once again to pray it together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In response, Dear family of faith, to all the goodness that God bestows upon us, let us now receive this morning's offering.
Let us pray together. How blessed we are, O oh God, to be citizens of your kingdom and to reveal his presence in the world through our words and deeds. Receive these gifts as representative of our commitment to that kingdom and enable us to use these gifts in ways that honor your kingdom's values and intentions. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our scripture this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And as I commonly do, I will weave those scriptures into the sermon this morning. Let us pray together. Once again, O oh gracious God, grant us ears to hear, minds that will understand, and hearts that will joyfully and faithfully follow Jesus wherever he leads us. Amen. In these past weeks following Easter, we've heard from the scriptures how the disciples struggled to understand Jesus' resurrection. And we can sympathize with them, can't we? Since the concept of resurrection truly boggles the mind. Resurrection never occurred before Jesus and it won't occur again until the end of time when God raises everyone from the dead. But resurrection wasn't the only issue the disciples struggled with. On the very night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he told them that he would be going away, but it just didn't sink in with them. Later that evening, he told them once again he was going away and that the Holy Spirit was coming to take his place. Jesus offered these cryptic words. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. But Jesus sent sadness among the disciples and he went on to declare, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The events that followed their last meal together probably moved these words to the back of their minds. But now Jesus and the eleven are gathered after resurrection on the holy mountain, and Jesus is preparing to say goodbye and depart. Luke tells us that for the past 40 days, Jesus has been teaching them about the kingdom of God. And so it's no small wonder then that as Jesus prepares to leave, that they ask him if this is a time that God will restore the kingdom to Israel. But Jesus tells them that even he doesn't know and that it's something that they don't need to know either. What they do need to know is that the Holy Spirit will come upon them and they will be witnesses not only in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, but also to the ends of the earth. Once again, Jesus gave his disciples plenty to think about. Luke tells us 
When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up for you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Since that time, the church has proclaimed, of course, that Jesus would come back at some point in time. However, the question has been and remains to this day, when will that be? However, as Jesus pointed out to the disciples, that was not a question to be asked. The real question was the one asked by the two men in white robes, presumably angels. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking toward heaven? However, I certainly can't fault the disciples for continuing to look into the skies as Jesus was being taken away. How often have we stood looking and waving longingly and lovingly as family members or friends were driving away after a wonderful visit? Now for these disciples, their beloved master, teacher, and Lord, the one they thought would always be with them was gone. I suspect too, as they were continuing to peer into the skies, it was a way of putting off the inevitable fact that life from that moment on would be radically different. The question from the angels was really a polite way of saying, okay, men, we're done here. It's time to get going on what Jesus has prepared you and told you to do. The event that Luke describes for us, of course, is what is called the Ascension. There are four foundational events in the life of Jesus. The incarnation at Christmas, Jesus' sacrificial death on Good Friday, and his glorious resurrection. The fourth event is the Ascension. The ascension is the act of Jesus assuming his rightful place at the right hand of the Father. Without the incarnation, the crucifixion, and resurrection, the ascension would, have been, would not have been possible, of course. But the ascension is an equally important part of the foundational events of the life of Christ. However, the ascension is not talked about very much, is it? But no less than the great 5th century theologian, St. Augustine, offered these words when he said that the ascension was more important as a festival of the Christian year, more important than Christmas, more important than Pentecost, even more important than Easter. That should come as a surprise to us. I mean, after all, if the ascension is so important, why is no one talking about it? Why is no one celebrating it? But Augustine further noted, for unless the Savior has ascended to heaven, his nativity would have come to nothing. His passion would have borne no fruit for us, and his most holy resurrection would have been useless to anyone but himself. But no one seems to know about or celebrate this momentous occurrence. For one thing, ascension, which by the way, always falls on Thursday, comes at a very busy time of the calendar year. We've not long come from celebrating the glory of Easter and then comes Mother's Day, graduation events, Memorial Day, and all of these occasions that demand our time and energy. And sometimes Ascension Day, which is celebrated on the Sunday nearest Ascension, falls on Mother's Day. It can easily get lost in our busy calendars. While we can understand goodbyes, I think we struggle, however, to relate to someone who mysteriously vanishes in a cloud. The fact is, however, that Jesus did not rise into the heavens and vanish into the sky as if he had been beamed up to heaven. First, the cloud that covered him was not merely the kind of cloud we normally think of that we see on mountaintops. It was the same cloud that led the Israelites out of Egypt and into the land of promise. It was the same cloud by which God used to speak to Moses on Mount Sinai. 
It was the same cloud that appeared on the mountain in which Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus, Peter, James, and John when Jesus was transfigured. This cloud is nothing less than the revelation of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit welcoming the victorious Son of God back into the fold of the Trinity. This cloud is called the Shekinah in Scripture, and it's descriptive of the glory of God. Jesus did not have to fly through the galaxies on his way to heaven. In the cloud, he entered another dimension that is heaven, re-entering the presence and glory of God. In so doing, he returned to the place from which he'd come, and more importantly, into the holy presence of the Godhead. Jesus had perfectly accomplished everything he'd been asked to do. And as a result of his victory, sin and death has been conquered. And he's ascended to the throne, his rightful place. Jesus' ascent is not about distance, but about the honor and glory given to the one who has indeed conquered. Imagine, if you will, Jesus running a marathon in the Summer Olympics. His life and death, all that he's given and sacrificed, is his preparation for that event. His resurrection is the victory as he crosses the finish line first. But though he has won the race, he is not yet the champion because he has not been crowned and received the gold medal. Jesus ascended to heaven and to his rightful throne is his coronation. His ascent into heaven and his coronation are good news for all of us who bear his name. For first, as he promised his disciples, his departure from earth opened the way for the Holy Spirit to come to earth and be present everywhere. We will celebrate that event next week as once again we celebrate Pentecost. And though Jesus was God, he was also limited as a human being, just as you and I are. We can only be at one place and at one time. Though sometimes our lives are so busy, we feel like we're in more than one place. But recall these cryptic words I read earlier from John's gospel. I am going away and I am coming to you. The Holy Spirit, who is also the Spirit of Christ indeed, would come upon these disciples 10 days after the ascension. The Spirit says Jesus will empower their lives and enable them to bear witness to the life, the ministry, the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And through the mystery that is the Trinity, Jesus is able to be present with his disciples even in the midst of his absence. And from his throne in heaven, Jesus is able to rule and oversee his kingdom here on earth. Though evil and death have been defeated, they continue to exert influence here on earth, though their days are surely numbered. As the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian church, for he must reign until all th things have been put under his feet. The last an enemy to be destroyed is death. Death and evil have been defeated, but they have not yet been destroyed. But total victory is assured. Recently, our nation celebrated the 75th anniversary of what is known as VE Day, when victory over Europe was declared during World War II. And even though victory was certain at that point, the war continued for some time. And so it is with the war of good and evil, life and death. But Jesus' ascension into heaven is also good news for another reason. When he was taken into the cloud, he was received with the body which he had been given at his birth. That means that at the ascension, God reaffirmed the goodness of all of creation, that all of creation has dignity and worth. It means that this dignity and worth is fulfilled and cemented and magnified in Christ. For Jesus is fully human, but also fully God. And it means, sisters and brothers, that a human being is now sitting in heaven at the right hand of God and ruling all of creation. As a result, our humanity is raised and ascended with him. And in a spiritual sense, Jesus has taken us with him. And yet, 
we, you and I, remain on earth, commissioned and called as we are as his disciples to continue to be witnesses. And like those first disciples, we in our own strength are powerless to do what we've been asked to do. But the disciples were receptive and remained in a prayerful mind as they began doing what Jesus had told them to do. We, of course, have been blessed with the presence of the same Spirit who filled those first 11 disciples. God has gifted us to do the work to which we've been called. I know a number of Christians who spend much of their time sky gazing, looking for Jesus, awaiting for his return. And while that may be interesting work to do, and certainly there's some value in it, I say in the end, it's not that helpful. For when those first disciples stopped looking for Jesus, they turned around and started looking at one another. And as the noted author and preacher Barbara Brown Taylor has written, and once they did that, surprising things began to happen. They began to say things that sounded like him. And they began to do things that they had never seen anyone but him do before. They became brave and capable and wise. May God make that so among us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. family of faith as we prepare to go into God's world let us offer our congregational covenant I go into the world with the faith of Jesus to love the Lord with all my heart soul mind and strength and to love my neighbor as myself and to do the good works of righteousness and as we go I charge you to remember God uses what you have to fill a need which you never could have filled God uses where you are to take you where you never could have gone. God uses what you can do to accomplish what you never could have done. God uses who you are to let you become who you never could have been. And now, family of faith, 
May the grace and peace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ be with you and abide with you this day and always. And all God's people said, Amen.